I'm going to let you in on an open secret. I have no talent in mixing music or t-shirt design. I cannot do an English accent, Irish accent, or Afrikaans accent to save my life. Nor do I have the vocal range to give you the deep-voiced opening you hear at the start of each episode. The good news for me is there is always Fiverr. Fiverr.com allows you to hire freelancers for sometimes as little as $5 to do tasks that you have to get done for your business or sing happy birthday to your spouse in ways that are impossible for you or honestly, the list could go on. Help yourself and help the show by using the link I provide in the show notes to see if Fiverr's freelancers can help you or if you have anything to offer Fiverr. My show was not possible without Fiverr. Some meaningful work in your life may now become possible with Fiverr. Go ahead and open the link in our show notes right now. Now, on to our show. This is Forgotten Wars. On the same day that Anne Struther's wagon train met humiliation near Bronkhorst Sprite, Captain G. Froome received an ominous dispatch. The dispatch had identical language to the one Anne Struther's force received before the ambush. The dispatch warned Captain Froome's force not to take another step forward. Like Anne Struther, Captain Froome was also heading to Praetoria on December 20th. Like Anne Struther, Captain Froome wasn't going to take orders from the Boers. Unlike Anne Struther, Captain Froome had taken earlier warnings seriously and prepared accordingly as his force traveled from Wackerstruem to Praetoria. Unlike Anne Struther's force, Froome's force wasn't weighed down with many supplies and civilians. Froome's force made a run for it to a nearby British garrison in Standerton. Imagine you're a soldier in Froome's force. You're about to cross the Fall River with the rest of your fellow soldiers when you look to your left and you can see Boers on horseback riding parallel to you. You're terrified because you know that an army is very vulnerable when it crosses a river. You keep glancing to your army's flank and the Boers keep following from a distance. Your thoughts are deafening. Why aren't they attacking? Are we going to make it to Standerton? Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence. Long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. As Captain Froome's force bolted for Standerton, Commandant Fondersky frantically tried to muster all nearby war forces for an ambush. Froome's force was too fast. They escaped to Standerton before Commandant von der Skyf saw his force fit to strike. Word slowly spread to all British forces across the Transvaal. The Boers had declared independence, and Anstruther had been beaten to surrender at Bronkhorst Sprite. British garrisons across the Transvaal built up their forts, dug systems of trenches, brought in scores or even hundreds of citizens loyal to the British, and prepared for the worst. The Boers primarily sought to besiege these garrisons only to bottle them up, not to make costly frontal attacks. The bulk of Boer forces not focused on blocking General Kale's entrance from Natal into the Transvaal were spread around the outskirts of Pretoria. Colonel Belair, the British officer charged with defending Pretoria, often far overestimated Boer forces roaming outside the city. After a mounted British scouting patrol suffered two wounded, British Lieutenant Colonel George Gildea decided to retaliate and mount the first British offensive of the war. On December 29th, about 160 men and 200 infantry stole upon the Red House Laher, only to find it abandoned, or so they thought. 
Some of Gildea's men begged for permission to loot the cattle in the Red House Laher's crawl. A crawl is, in this context, a fenced area used for corralling cattle. Gildea reluctantly agreed. The mounted men surged forward for the spoil, and then were hit with a hail of war bullets. Four mounted men were wounded before the group escaped the ambush. Boredom befell the besieged British at Pretoria for another week. Then on January 6th, Gildea and about 150 cavalry and 200 infantry surprised field cornet Hans Wurta's 40 men at Fenter's Farm Laher. The British took their first large group of prisoners, 17, but suffered more casualties in their frontal brute force attack. During this British attack on Fenter's Farm Laher, the Boers soiled their reputation some more with another lightning surrender. One Boer panicked and rose a white flag. Hans Boerta angrily tore down this unauthorized white flag. Then Boers gunned down two British officers who had gone forward with white flags to negotiate. Belairs warned all his troops of these savage proceedings. Lieutenant Colonel Gildea reported on what he had learned about the Boers so far. Quote, the Boers will never attack in the open. They are most tenacious to stones and cover, and it is very hard to get them out. Their principal tactics are traps, and as they are well-mounted and have a thorough knowledge of the country, they can travel fast and take up positions wherever they like. Cavalry with light artillery are the only troops that can be used with any effect against the Boers. Infantry are only useful for holding positions, as the Boers will never let them come near enough to them in the open. General Cawley wouldn't learn these lessons until it was too late. The Boers also learned from these skirmishes. They quickly replaced Commandant Erasmus for incompetence, for allowing the British attack at Fenter's Farm to be a surprise attack. Assistant Commandant General Hendrik Schumann took Erasmus's place and immediately reformed the Boer communication system. Schumann set up a series of signal fires to allow timely communication between Boer detachments outside Pretoria. That way, reinforcements could be rapidly rushed anywhere. If only the Boers had been this quick to replace incompetent leadership in the Second Boer War. Further British probes of besieging Boers proved unprofitable. By January, the war around Pretoria stood at a stalemate. Though the Boers saw British garrisons as a sideshow, these garrisons did divert hundreds of Boers that could have been devoted to the Boers' main focus, along the Transvaal-Natal border. Sir Garnett Wolseley mentored and, through political machinations, made sure that Major General Sir George Pomeroy Colley took his dual role as the Governor of Natal and High Commissioner for all of South Africa, save the Cape Colony. Wolseley and then Colley assumed military and political authority in their position. Why? Part of it was they didn't want the same conflict between civil and military authorities during the Zulu Wars to cause some of the same mistakes made during those wars. Kale answered directly to the British Secretary of the Colonies and to the Secretary of War. Kale technically outranked Sir Owen Lanyon, the Transvaal Administrator. By the time Kale heard on December 19th of the Transvaal Republic's declaration, he had proven himself as an efficient administrator, but had never had independent command of troops in combat yet. Kale woefully lacked cavalry and troops in general. But Colley did not lack respect for or early intelligence on Boer tactics and abilities. He esteemed the Boers as better shots and as better practiced in rapid mounting and dismounting of their horses. On December 27th, Commandant General Jobert led an 800-man commando from the provisional capital of Heidelberg to begin patrolling the Transvaal-Natal border. Within a month, there were around a thousand Boers in the Standerton Wackerstruum Langsneck area. Each Boer carried 75 rounds of ammunition, but that was all the ammunition they had. Kale couldn't count on Cape reinforcements, but he did receive 120 reinforcements for his Natal Frontier Force on December 30th, along with five artillery pieces and two Gatling guns via ship. Kale's force at Newcastle near Langsneck swelled to over 600 with reinforcements from the Natal town of Peter Maritzburg. What also came from Peter Maritzburg on January 6th is news you already know, the unsettling, gory news of the disaster at Bronk Horse Sprite. A couple weeks later, Kale's force swelled to about a 1,000. Kale became his own worst enemy at about this time. 
Collet worried in a letter to his mentor Wolseley that public opinion in Britain would perceive Collet as being too slow and too cautious. In the letter, Collet wondered if it would be a bad idea to attack the Boer forces near Lang's Neck without waiting for promised British reinforcements to arrive from India. Collet appears to rationalize what would be a rash decision by arguing that the British garrison in Pachofstrum would fall by mid-February if he didn't relieve it. Collet knew all too well he had insufficient cavalry, but still justified his decision to attack Lang's neck in a letter to the two British cabinet members he answered to. Except in that letter, he emphasized the harm that inaction would have on South Africa's political situation, not the hit his reputation in Britain could take. Blinded by arrogance, Collet then wrote an accidentally insulting letter to Commandant General Yobert. Collet argued sincerely that he wanted to avoid unnecessary bloodshed and urged Yobert to disband his army and to trust in the empty promises of British administration in the Transvaal. Collet threatened Yobert with the might of the British Empire that Collet assured was just behind him. Historian Jean Leband quotes Collet's inflammatory letter as reading, quote, The men who follow you are, many of them, ignorant, and no one understand little of anything outside their own country. But you, who are well educated and have traveled, cannot but be aware how hopeless is the struggle you have embarked upon, and how little any accidental success gained can affect the ultimate result. End quote. So oblivious, Collie assured the British Secretary of State days later that he had avoided communicating anything to Boers that, quote, would tend to embitter the relations between them and the British government, end quote. What was worse for Kale? European opinion and South African opinion was turning in favor of the Transvaal Boers. The Cape Colony and Orange Free State passed resolutions urging the British not to turn Afrikaner opinion against the empire by controlling the Transvaal at gunpoint. 7,000 petitions for peace were gathered in the Netherlands. Even with its heavy English population, the Natal Legislative Council passed a resolution that put all costs for fighting Transvaal rebels on the British back. The officially neutral Orange Free State funneled weapons and supplies to the Transvaal. President Brand of the Orange Free State cabled Collet's boss, the Secretary of State Lord Kimberley, on January 25th to initiate mediation. These efforts were interrupted three days later with news from Lang's Neck. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind-the-mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash forgotten wars. That is patreon.com slash forgotten wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated. Now, back to our episode. Commandant Yobert officially counted 16 Boers dead and 27 wounded after the Battle of Lang's Neck. The British casualties? We'll get to that. The pass over Lang's Neck cuts through the middle of a six-mile semicircle of hills. The Boers picked the perfect hilltops for what was already a naturally strong defensive position. Yobert stated that about 600 Boers held these positions. Collet laid out his plan to his officers on January 27th. First, Distract the Boers with each artillery piece firing around a minute. About half of Kale's men would advance on the positions that the artillery was softening up. The other half, about 494 infantry, would scale the ridge, leading to what Kale thought the key of the Boer position was, Table Mountain. These infantry would then storm Table Mountain. Contingents of both forces would be detached to further flank and overrun Boer hilltop holds. Once the Boers fell back, the British mounted soldiers would give chase, with British artillery moving up to bombard the retreating Boers. 
Kale's force marched out of camp at 6.15 a.m. with each man carrying 17 rounds and having ready access to hundreds of reserve rounds. About 250 officers and enlisted men guarded camp. A large group of mounted wars left this camp alone when they saw how securely it was held. Kale and company couldn't afford lots of errors. They made many. First, Kale did not fully incorporate the Natal mounted police in his attacks. This colonial force had better training and experience operating in this specific terrain than the Boers' mounted squadron. Despite acknowledging at many points that he lacked sufficient cavalry, Kale probably kept the Natal mounted police in reserve for at least two reasons. First, British officers harbored a notorious distrust of white colonial troops. This distrust persisted through the Second Boer War, too. Kale also wanted to contain any perception that there was a civil war between white South Africans. So the Natal Mounted Police were kept in reserve. British artillery began shelling Boer positions at 9.25 a.m., according to plan. Then the British made their second mistake. The British assumed the Boers couldn't stand fast under artillery fire, certainly not for more than 15 minutes. When a few Boer Mounted men did panic and gallop away, the British broke into cheers, believing the Boers were running away. Fifteen minutes later, Phase 2 began. Five of Kale's officers mounted their horses and led the 58th Regiment forward, making the third mistake. They hadn't heard, or simply refused to adapt to the fact that Boer marksmen targeted officers first during the Battle of Bronkhorst Sprite. When 50 Boers fired on the 58th Regiment's right flank, the head of the small mounted squadron, Major Brownlow, made the fourth mistake. Kale made Major Brownlow responsible for protecting the right flank if it came under attack. Without coordinating with any other company of the 58th Regiment and without scouting for the best way to reach the Boers that were firing on the regiment, Brownlow led the mounted squadron in a reckless charge up the steepest part of the hill. Most of the horses were exhausted before they even reached the crest. The Boers withdrew, finding natural cover again. Thirty-three mounted Boers rushed in for support. Brownlow was thrown from his horse. Another British officer rushed ahead, firing his revolver, killing one Boer and wounding another before he was shot down. Private John Dugan dismounted his horse and demanded that Brownlow take it. One Boer bullet struck Private Dugan, but Brownlow managed to escape. Dugan won the Victoria Cross for his courage. Some more inexperienced mounted infantry charged up the crest, saw the chaotic scene of riderless horses and mayhem, and galloped back down the hill, leaving Brownlow's original group to fend for themselves. Brownlow wouldn't even speak to his mounted infantry when he returned to camp. But Brownlow blundered twice in this charge. If he had led his contingent unmounted up the hill, their horses' fresher legs would have enabled better success. Instead of handling his men like proper mounted infantry, Brownlow led them as if they were cavalry he was used to leading. The 58th Regiment faced further adversity when it realized that the hillside they were scaling was a 1 in 15 gradient, much steeper than it appeared through their officers' field glasses the previous day. On top of that, rain fell on this grass-covered hill the day before so that it slowed the infantry and horses' progress to a crawl. Then it got worse. About 100 Boers opened fire on the regiment's right flank again, this time with no mounted squadron to protect them. The British exhaustedly rushed and slipped up the slick hill as fast as they could to the summit. About 80 Boers were waiting and swelling with trickling reinforcements. What shocked the British? Side by side with the Boers, firing on the British, were several natives. As British Colonel Dean's men reached the summit, Boers behind breastworks began firing on the exposed, exhausted British. Dean saw no other choice but to lead a bayonet charge with men that were almost too exhausted to stand. But the men cheered and waved both British colors as they stumbled forward. This was the last time any British force carried the colors into battle. Dean led from the front, still riding his horse. A bullet struck Dean's arm. Dean dismounted. Dean strode forward well ahead of his men, and continued firing his revolver. Another bullet pierced his head, dropping him dead. Each of Kale's five officers rode into battle. Only Major Lucky Essex survived. 
Essex had also survived the disaster at Isankowana two years earlier during the Zulu War. At 11 a.m., Major Essex finally saw the wisdom in abandoning the frontal attack and led an orderly retreat. As the British artillery, ironically, covered a British retreat, their shelling did hold back Boer pursuers, but also killed some British wounded lying hopelessly on the hill. One contingent of the 58th Regiment formed a courageous, effective rearguard during the retreat. A flag would cost more lives. Lieutenant Bailey was carrying the regimental colors. LeBand writes, quote, The colors were being carried by the two junior officers of a battalion, escorted by a color party, to encourage the line forward in an attack, or to serve as a rallying point in defense. To lose a color to the enemy was the ultimate disgrace. Colors were clearly at risk in the scrambling fighting typical of Victorian small wars, and certainly no longer had any place on a battlefield dominated by accurate long-range rifle fire. Wolseley believed that to order young officers to carry the colors into battle was nothing short of murder, and in 1882 it was ordered that they were no longer to do so, end quote. But this was January 1881. Lieutenant Bailey suffered a bullet wound while carrying the colors. Lieutenant Peel offered to help Bailey escape the battlefield, but Bailey said, quote, Never mind me. Save the colors. End quote. Lieutenant Peel stumbled into an ant bear hole shortly after. Thinking Peel was wounded, a sergeant rushed the colors down the hill and eventually out of action. Lieutenant Hill galloped up the hill to save the wounded Lieutenant Bailey. When Lieutenant Hill couldn't get Bailey onto his horse, Hill carried Bailey in his arms until Bailey was shot dead. Lieutenant Hill would not be denied. He rushed up the hill again to rescue a wounded man. Then again. Hill won the Victoria Cross for his heroics. Wars attempted an attack on the British left flank as they retreated, but this proved fruitless. Yobert calculated that following up with a counterattack would be too costly for his Boer force, though he wished he had 200 more men to make that counterattack. After the British withdrew their camp, a few hours' march away, some British were allowed to go back to the battlefield to collect their dead and wounded. The British force fired an average of 17 rounds per person, far more than Colonel Caldwell calculated was normally shot in a small war battle, and nearly triple the average infantrymen fired against much more Zulu warriors at the Battle of Ulundi. Kale begrudgingly observed that the Boers fought courageously even at close range. They showed no fear from ranges of 20 to 200 yards. The British who came to bury the dead and help the wounded did walk upon wars, stripping all the necessary supplies and weaponry they could, but they showed decency in allowing the British to treat the wounded. And there were a lot of wounded, over a hundred. Eighty British died. Kale's officer corps virtually wiped out. Yobert wrote in relief after the battle to Assistant Commandant General P.A. Cronier that the British had been defeated with heavy casualties, quote, with the help of God, end quote. Speaking solemnly to his men after the defeat at Lang's Neck, Kale took complete responsibility for the defeat and told his men that what they did on the battlefield did not lose, quote, one atom of the prestige of England, end quote. Kale then made an empty vow, quote, we certainly shall take possession of that hill eventually, end quote. Just two weeks later, Kale had a chance at redemption. <laughs> 